How about it on Fridays, this guy follows it all. I'd say the Taylor Swift movie may be the only movie that Michael... Yeah, I'd he's probably see not him gonna having argue reviewed it. it per se, but uh, I would love to see him in that movie though. That'd be really funny. <laughs> shake he it loves off. music. He's not a snob at all. Hop on and, your um, rainbow and shake, shake, shake it. Yeah, he comes and goes on a rainbow. How about it for the culture blaster, Michael Snyder? Hi, Michael. Well, hi everybody, and uh, allow me to uh, begin by throwing my hat. In the ring for the house speaker position i've decided <laughs> i am an independent but i feel i can lead these guys better than a quasi kkk member and a uh, uh, another of the various lunatics that's uh, lined up out of the gop um you know guys it's friday the 13th uh oh, do yeah. you feel lucky punk do you <laughs> Anyway, I forgot I was, it was Friday the 13th. Wow. Crappy Clint Eastwood impressions aside, I want to point out how lucky I am to be teamed with this sterling group. I shall identify them with their Viking warrior names. Mark the Marvelous, Kim the Canny, Albert the Awesome, and Tony the Terrific for the past year on the Mark Thompson Show. Happy anniversary. Oh, that's all. so great. Thank you very much, Michael. I have to say we're so grateful for your contributions every week. Really are. So thank I you. I appreciate that. And and also the uh, the good word goes out to uh, Courtney the Crime Buster, uh, of course, uh, John the Judge Daly, and our very own superhero team of political pundits, Jim Avila, Michael Shore, and David K. Johnson, our legal eagle David Katz, and other various contributors, and of course our devoted and sometimes prickly audience. The highest compliment <laughs> I can pay is that this is a show that I listen to regularly, even Apparently. when I'm not on it. I mean, I don't have to be on it. Anyway, thank you, everybody. Um, so this is, as Kim and Mark have pointed out, an uncommon Friday in the movie industry due to a leggy blonde gorilla, an attractive one, by the way, who can write smart, tuneful songs, sing them and put on a spectacular show. There are no major studio releases coming out this weekend. Nobody they wants to take on the Swift. I love it. Scared. They were reluctant to go up against the big concert documentary, Taylor Swift, The Eras Tour. And no... You're right, Kim. I didn't see it, despite my affection for a lot of the recordings in her post-country music career. Um, some films that were supposed to be released today were rescheduled. But in the meantime, I have a couple of recent direct-to-streaming movies and a couple less splashy documentaries to cover, all worth your attention as much as Tay-Tay's Swift the Palooza. So uh, shall I get to the, uh, the goods? Please, do the honors. I shall. I shall. Uh, okay, um, let's start with something that has a little whiff of poignance about it, and I'll explain why. Last week, we briefly acknowledged the great director, William Friedkin, uh, who brought us the groundbreaking horror movie, The Exorcist, in the context of a less than satisfying sequel, The Exorcist Believer, that he had nothing to do with. This guy's filmography includes, among other things, the French Connection, Sorcerer, To Live and Die in L.A., The Boys in the Band, and much more. And sadly, he died in August at the age of 87. But William Friedkin left us one last feature film, and it's a very good one. He directed The Kane Mutiny Court Martial, which is a new movie version of author Herman Woke's Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Kane Mutiny, uh, which is about a provocative American military trial brought about by events that occur on a U.S. Navy minesweeper in the Pacific during World War II. Uh, in 1954, the book was adapted into a renowned film that starred Humphrey Bogart as Captain Quig of the USS Kane and co-starred, get this star power, Joel Ferrer, Van Johnson, and Fred McMurray. It was a critical and box office success, and now we have Friedkin's very tight, taut, sharply directed, and very well-acted remake about the court-martial of the Kane's executive officer for mutiny. The setting is modern, with the Kane assigned to the Middle East theater, where a sudden storm compels the first officer to take command of the Kane away from its captain. But the story loses none of its impact in what is largely a cosmetic update, uh, save for some stagey stuff at the end. The cast is led by Kiefer Sutherland as Captain Quig, uh, a humorless, demanding perfectionist, Jake Lacey as Lieutenant Steve Merrick, 
uh, the Kane's first officer who has been accused of mutiny by Quig. Jason Clark is Barney Greenwald, the reluctant naval officer uh, who is a lawyer ordered to defend Merrick. And the late Lance Reddick, who you may recall as the concierge in the John Wick movies, playing the head of the Navy Tribunal deciding the case. The actors, including the supporting cast, are gold star, with uh, Sutherland giving one of his most compelling performances as Quig. It's not quite bogey saying, who stole the strawberries? But it's damned potent. And the whole enterprise uh, is not one of those black and white morality tales. The outcome is going to leave you musing about duty, psychological fitness for combat, the military chain of command, and much more. My verdict on the Kane Mutiny Court Martial, guilty of being a top-notch drama. Oh. It's on Paramount Plus, so you don't even have you to go to the movie theaters. Dream it right now. Wow, I'm a huge Friedkin fan, so that would really be... That's terrific. To hear that you liked it is terrific. All right. What else do uh, you have, okay. Michael? So uh, Fair Play was a genuine find for me. Um, uh, someone suggested I check it out. It debuted on Netflix a couple of days ago, and I thought, oh, direct to Netflix. How good could this be? Well, it's very good. Uh, it's an interpersonal relationship drama set amid the dog-eat-dog -dog world of high finance as a couple of big-time stockbrokers at the same firm are romantically involved in defiance of corporate policy. So right after they get engaged on the sly, one of them is promoted, throwing them into a quandary, uh, to say the least. Uh, the confluence of office politics, money madness, and sexual tension is explosive. And what Fair Play says about corporate greed and gender imbalance in modern society is really hot stuff. So I don't know the work of uh, filmmaker Chloe Domont, but this is really impressive. Her script crackles. Her direction is assured. And of course, the talents and chemistry of her lead actors are crucial to the success of the movie. So who does she have? Phoebe Dynavor, uh, uh, who is in fact the woman who played Daphne Bridgerton on the immensely popular Bridgerton TV series. And Alden Ehrenreich, the guy who played young Han Solo in Solo, A Star Wars Story, uh, played the lovers and co-workers, Emily and Luke. And they are fantastic. And the veteran uh, UK character actor, Eddie Marsden, I think American audiences know him as Terry on Ray Donovan, the uh, palsy uh, brother, ex-boxer. Uh, he plays their prick of a boss. And man, he leaves a brutal impression. So this is often profane. Uh, so I bring this to the attention of anybody uh, who is a little upset by, you know, salty language and uh, physical activity. Uh, but it's always powerful. Uh, about sex, love, business ethics, and ambition. Highly recommended, again, except for the faint of heart. Uh, Fair Play is on Netflix. Really wow. impressed by it. Wow. Look at you. A couple of streamers that he likes. Uh, by yeah, the way, I, I mean, uh, Tom says that Qu Tom is the keeper of the ding here. He yeah. says uh, quandary is a ding word. Profane is a ding word, by the way. Yeah. Really? Thank you. In what in what universe is, is profane? I know it's yeah. something that people want to avoid in some cases. Anyway, uh, I do want to talk about a couple of documentaries uh, other than the Taylor Swift one. Uh, Make Me Famous. Oh, by the way, both have kind of Bay Area connections for our Bay Area uh, audience members. Make Me Famous is a documentary about a little known painter, uh, a gay man and kind of troublemaker and, and sort of yeah, just one of those oddballs living in the East Village in the 80s, uh, whose work actually has become far more respected uh, since he disappeared with nobody knowing what became of him uh, during a trip to France. This guy's name uh, is, in fact, uh, he, he, the, guy, the guy's name is uh, Brzezinski. And we just don't know whatever happened to Edward Brzezinski, except that he was a, a peer of Jean-Michel Basquiat and Keith Haring in the 80s art scene in New York. He was not one that became famous then, and he was desperate for attention. And the crazy thing about this movie is it, uh, there were all kinds of, um, we'll call them uh, communes, like creative communes and and kind of gatherings of people, like Club 57 in the East Village. It was uh, so rough 
back then in that ne- uh, neighborhood. He, this guy, Ed Brzezinski, actually lived in a squat across from a men's shelter. And everything looks really, when you look at the old vintage footage, and there's a lot of it, everything looks really pretty bombed out. But he had his own little gallery space in there, and he promoted his shows in more upscale galleries, much to the chagrin of the snooty types. And uh, am- amazingly enough, the uh, talking heads from today uh, are uh, some of whom were peers, one of whom was a lover of his, and they're so um, dismissive and so kind of nasty in some ways, even though they do express a little bit of affection for the guy. Uh, and you see his work, which does have a, a certain power to it. And I like the fact that it covers the scene and lets you know a little bit about what was going on back then and also introduces this kind of almost enigmatic fellow, uh, Edward Brzezinski. But Make Me Famous uh, was compelling throughout, directed by Brian Vincent, and uh, it's available uh, in theaters uh, starting this weekend. And, you know, if it's the sort of thing you're interested in, I would just jump on this movie. It really is an amazing experience. You're saying that the it's somebody you don't know and someone who was connected to a world that was quite high profile and transformative in the art world and beyond? Well, Edward Brzezinski is one of the guys, you know, Kenny Scharf, well-known artist from the era, obviously Keith Haring, and I did mention Basquiat. Sure. They, they yeah. became sort of stars, and this guy was their peer, and he was just sort of self-promoting, and the, the, people dismissed him. He was kind of a scamp. Uh, one of his ex-lovers uh, is so, um, you know, so dismissive of him uh, in some ways. It, it's kind of amazing to see. And then uh, the other people really loved and and kind of miss him. And the actual filmmaking crew goes in search of what happened to him over in Europe to try to uh, solve the mystery of his disappearance. Oh, I see. Makes, oh. Which makes it even more fascinating. But, you know, even Eric Bogosian was part of that scene, the, uh, the actor and writer, and he speaks uh, at some length about Brzezinski uh, during the interview segments. Uh, Julie says scamp is a ding word. I would agree with that. Um, it's one of those great short ding words. Tom has said chagrin and enigmatic. I didn't even hear you say enigmatic, but okay, go ahead. Well, and by the way, it, Make it, Me Famous, is it streamable or is it in theaters only? It's in theaters right now, but it will be great to watch streaming at home. Okay, um, good. Also in theaters uh, this weekend, and uh, actually the antithesis of uh, Taylor Swift movie, yeah. uh, Joan Baez, I Am a Noise, a really wonderful and heartbreaking and psychologically resonant documentary about the great uh, singer, uh, songwriter, folk artist, and icon of the 60s, uh, including segments about her relationship with Bob Dylan. They had, um, you know, a a deep, um, you know, loving relationship, and she covered some of uh, Dylan's songs. And in fact, her version of Dylan's Love Minus Zero is the absolute pinnacle uh, of that particular song. No one has done it better, including Dylan. She had a beautiful crystalline voice. She's still getting it done in her late 70s. She lives here in California. Uh, she is well beloved in the Bay Area. Her uh, sister, who is also addressed in the um, course of the movie, and one of her two sisters was Mimi Farina, uh, who married the novelist and singer songwriter Richard Farina and used to tour as a duo. And Mimi is the woman who was behind the Bread and Roses uh, charitable concert series here in the Bay Area that raised tons of money for all kinds of good causes. And uh, Mimi no longer with us, but uh, Joan, uh, you know, speaks about her relationship. Uh, it's almost like a therapy session in a lot of ways, but there's a lot of vintage footage, recent and um, and older performances by Joan. And the woman is a, is a marvel. And it's, again, a little heartbreaking when you hear about some of the family secrets that get revealed over the course of the film. Uh, Joan Baez, I Am a Noise, it's in the theaters. And it was directed by Mira Devasky, uh, Karen O'Connor, and Maeve O'Boyle. And um, I, I think it's really... Uh, a worthwhile piece of work. Again, it's the flip side of Taylor Swift, to be sure. Yeah. Uh, She came up, Joan Baez did at a time that that folk scene, folk rock scene was exploding, right? 
It was a major thing. And remember, she was uh, married to anti-war activist David Harris, who was actually locked up. And there's stuff about him in here and about her commitment to uh, peace and freedom and the various anti-war movements. There's a lot of stuff covered over the course of uh, I Am a Noise and all of it worthwhile. So for um, worthy films to bring to your attention again in a week when there are no major studio releases, unless you want to consider um, the Taylor Swift film, one of them. Well, Joan, but you can see these movies in between or around. You're running to the theater to see Taylor Swift. Joan Baez, I am noise. I am a I noise. I am a noise. I am yeah. a noise. I am a noise. Um, Michael really liked it. I thought it was a way to get inside the head and the life of Joan Baez, almost like a therapy session, he said. Make Me Famous is the story that need be told about the connective tissue between a lot of high-profile people in the art world and the focus of the story. What is his name again? Uh, Edward Brzezinski, a man who uh, disappeared in the early 2000s um, after basically struggling to get attention as an artist in a, in a scene that had already crowned a bunch of superstars that were his peers. Mm. Fair play set in the world of high finance, romantic entanglements, Profanity. Michael liked it. Yeah, man. You if, can... you want to, if you want to see Phoebe, uh, pardon me, if you want to see Daphne Bridgerton get it on with Han Solo, this is your movie. <laughs> uh, what? And where, where is uh, that playing? No, 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 no. What? What was it? What? Netflix. Netflix. There you go. You never need to leave the comfort of your own place. And finally, the Kane Mutiny Court Martial, the Friedkin movie that he directed prior to his death. I guess that goes without saying. It would be huff, tough for him to direct it after his death. Kiefer Sutherland is the lead as Queeg. And apparently it's a cast that is formidable. And a rewrite of the Kane Mutiny as the Kane Mutiny Court Martial that Michael really likes. And I saw in the chat... Many people going, how could they ever rewrite that film? How could, it, you know, it seems as though it's, you know, one for the ages. But you feel they've done it, right, Michael? Uh, it, there's no way to, you know, obviously compare it to the original because of its, you know, time and era and what have you. But the update doesn't really hurt, hurt this at all. And it, it is a timeless story about, uh, again, uh, chain, chain of command, uh, fitness for duty, and a lot of things that, you know, become even more apparent during wartime. And, uh, of course, we have some serious conflict in the world right now. So uh, maybe this is uh, even more timely than you would think. Um, I do want to quickly mention some uh, TV programs I'm excited about, have been watching, and would like to recommend, one of which is The Continental, which is basically um, three uh, mini-movies creating a little mini series available on Peacock that is a prequel to the John Wick films all about the uh, origins of uh, Winston, the man in charge of the Continental, the uh, hotel where all of the uh, miscreants and assassins can go safely and uh, you know, yes, interact. I'm yes, sorry, sorry, uh, Michael, go ahead. Miscreants. And, uh, and in, in, in fact, um, they... Um, uh, they tell the story of how Winston finds himself in the position he's eventually in in the John Wick movies. And the guy who's in charge of the Continental in the 70s, uh, this uh, series begins in Winston's youth with his brother in the 50s. And then you accelerate into the 70s uh, with lots of great needle drops and a performance by a detestable individual. As a detestable individual, Mel Gibson plays the bastard in charge of the Continental. Um, and um, it, it's, uh, you know, as much as we don't like to see him succeed because of his uh, political and religious beliefs being so radical and, um, you know, difficult. And, and again, uh, I don't want to get into the depths of it, but he's quite good as this monstrous fellow in charge of, of the hotel. He and, left, the, uh, uh, left the anti-Semitism back at the uh, at the house, and he performed well on the set, is what you're telling me. But, yeah, well, I'm, um, I'm telling you that. It, it's funny, the guy that he portrays is sort of a, a, a Christian fanatic on top oh, of being so a, a bastard. So I thought, Let oh, me, that's uh, why Do I need to, have, to be familiar with John Wick, the series of films, to enjoy no, the no, Continental? No, 
No, not really. But there's a lot okay. of, you know, boom crack, you know, martial arts fighting. It's Good. it's okay. not up to the movie's quality level for what those movies are. But I was diverted by it. I enjoyed watching it. Uh, I was far more excited by Lupin series two, the mm. great French actor Omar Sy playing um, a man in France who's uh, got a real love of the uh, fictional character uh, Lupin, who's sort of a gentleman thief and has been uh, living his life according to the the uh, philosophies and behavior of this fictional character and uh, his estranged wife and son get caught up in it. Uh, and uh, Emmanuel Seigne, um, uh, not Emmanuel Seigne, uh, God, um, uh, there's a French actress who plays his wife, who's who's really quite good in the in the movie. Uh, and also, um, if you haven't watched series one, uh, this thing is on Netflix. I highly recommend it. And finally, I do want to mention um, Loki series two, part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but on Disney Plus, a series with the great Tom Hiddleston as Loki, god of mischief, caught up with the time variance uh, authority. Uh, who are trying to control the timeline, prevent it from breaking into alternate universes and failing to do so. So it's up to Loki and a TVA officer played by Owen Wilson uh, in buddy picture fashion to try to save the multiverse. And I love the show. They, these guys are so charismatic and fun. Disney Plus. Well, man, you really uh, you found some stuff on television that you really enjoyed. And uh, you found actually pretty positive reviews for everything involved here today. Michael, what's happened to you? It's well, great. you know, there's I'm never been mood, anything like the, this. <laughs> uh, thanks to the beatdown of the Dallas Cowboys last Sunday, I've been in a great mood for five days, man. It has been pretty strong. Um, Michael lives and dies by the fortunes of the Niners, Giants, and Dubs. You don't have any love for the hockey team? The Sharks? Uh, I'm, a I'm a Philadelphia Flyers fan. Oh, I see. Okay. Died in All the right. wool. Since uh -huh. since childhood. Uh, Michael, we love you. The Culture Blaster can be found across social media as just that, the Culture Blaster. And, he and Mark, let's let's point out on threads and on Instagram as Mike the Knife 123. Oh, Mike the Knife 123. Don't leave out the three. If you get Mike the Knife 12, it's a totally different dude. Mike the Knife 123. He comes and goes. Where's the rainbow? Oh, there it is. <laughs> oh, my God. Bye, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Hey, go Niners. Go Niners. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.